Okay, so welcome everybody to the session that we have labelled as universities and, and economic growth. Um, I'm Professor Nigel Driffield. I am one of the, the leads at Warwick on the Utopia project. Um, the purpose of, of this session is really to explore some of the issues, not just around economic growth in terms of simple sort of GDP or whatever, but how universities and collaboration between universities and our wider sort of stakeholders and partners um, can generate better outcomes in terms of what is, is to use the current terminology, inclusive growth. In other words, growth for, for everybody. Um, so what we have is we have a, a series of, of presentations or series of discussions where I will try to provide some links between them um, involving um, three people who I am going to let them introduce themselves now uh, in order. So perhaps Martin first. Thanks, Nigel, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Martin Reeves, I'm uh, Chief Executive at the City Council in Coventry and a uh, recovering academic. Thank you. Um, and Arno? Good afternoon, everybody. I am Arnaud Lefranc. I'm Vice President at CY Sergi Paris University uh, in charge of international scientific development. And I'm also a professor of economics there. And Anais. OK. Hi, I'm Anais Tarago. I'm an economist, too, and I'm I work at the University Pompeu Fabra in Barcelona, and I'm the uh, director of the University Pompeu Fabra uh, Foundation. And I'm working at the um, Utopia project at the working package that it's called uh, Placemaking. Okay, thank you. So that, that provides us with a, a nice kind of segue into Martin, who is going to kick us off talking about what he thinks, I guess, universities should be doing better in this space. But I don't want to put words in his mouth, so I shall mute myself and hand over to Martin. Thanks, Nigel. So some, some comments, probably five blocks of thoughts from me. As I say, importantly, as a chief executive uh, of, of a large UK city, uh, within a very, very fast growing region in the West Midlands in the UK, and also somebody that does know universities well, having been previously a, re a researcher, lecturer, an academic with, with a background in, in economics as well. So a real sense of, of an academic background, but understanding policy, uh, perhaps most importantly, practice on the ground about when people talk, quite frankly, Nigel and colleagues, about inclusive growth and about levelling up. I'm afraid that is not a virtual concept. This is a kind of contact sport every single day about how you bind uh, outcomes in for all of our people in our places, whether it be Brussels, Barcelona, Coventry, anywhere else. This does not happen by accident. It requires significant rewiring, and I'll, I'll come back to that at the end. So five very quick points. I'd love to hear from other uh, panellists as well, so I'll, I'll be brief. Uh, the first one, look, the, the reality, the economic reality in terms of output and impact is that universities, and I'm, I'm absolutely privileged to have University of Warwick and also Coventry University in the city of Coventry, they in themselves are significant employers, commissioners of significant services, they're builders, they're developers, generators of activity and productivity in and of themselves, full stop. That's inescapable truth. Uh, there's been some amazing impact analyses that we've done uh, through the universities themselves to demonstrate that economic value. But here's the point, for placemaking, for economic development in the current context, more critically, as I said at the opening ceremony, universities are locally committed, of course, but at the same time globally connected, necessarily. And ultimately they are anchor, or at their best, they should be anchor institutions. Understanding, if you like, the, the DNA of their place so that they can not just generate that economic value, but also understand what I always call the heartbeat of the place in which they draw um, a lot of their history and hopefully a lot of their future as well. And so that makes them, whether universities embrace it as fully as maybe they should do, makes them not just anchor institutions, it makes them 
placemakers, place shapers alongside municipalities and great public sector anchor organisations and our business communities as well. And I think that is something that increasingly, and certainly for Utopia and other uh, programmes, we're starting to see just how powerful that alignment can be. So that, that's number one. Universities, of course, are massive in and of themselves in order to develop economic growth and development for their own areas. But there's so much more and they need to continue to grasp that. My second point is about place. And I've spoken quite widely about the need, certainly in a UK setting, for us to become much more comfortable about what I call the layer cake of placemaking. And what I mean by the layer cake and the various tiered levels, the way our communities, our businesses, our supply chains, our universities draw and work means that we should be as comfortable about understanding the economic vitality at an incredibly local level and how inclusive that is, a relatively small catchment area for hundreds of households as we are about the impact that we can only make at a city level because of the scale that's required. And as easily comfortable as we go up the cake to what it might mean to work in our case in a really powerfully high graph ambitious region like the West Midlands, to then think about the UK and the GDP and the output and the UK policy economically and indeed internationalization. Those things are mutually exclusive, everyone. And I think in economic development and placemaking terms, all of our institutions, including our universities, must get much more comfortable of being able to move in and out of those various layers and be comfortable to build collaborations for economic growth at the relative and the correct spatial level. And to be honest about those areas where it is best to play at one tier or another, and they don't need to be mutually exclusive. So that'll be my second point. Place needs to be understood. It's very different according to how people perceive it, but universities particularly need to understand that layering. Thirdly, and this is really important, what I sense are the key elements or characteristics uh, which defines really strong place shaping and place making through an economic development lens, which is about inclusivity and genuinely not just about output, economically, but is about being able to create value and productivity uh, across a raft of, of really important social policy areas. And I think this is quite a straightforward uh, set of rules and characteristics we're looking for. Number one, there must be a compelling vision for change. And that must be brought into all partners, all communities, all businesses. It must be consistent, it must be coherent, it must be compelling, and it must be for the medium and long term. Number two, you need to have a clarity of strategy. How in that economic and place shaping world are you prepared again in the medium term to ensure that it is sufficiently understood what are the strategic priorities for all of our institutions and all of our key stakeholders, including universities, to deliver that vision for a greater, more inclusive, more economically prosperous and sustainable place? Thirdly, you need a well-developed and well-resourced set of plans. And this is my point, at various levels, those plans for growth, for connectivity might well be best primed and delivered, for example, solely by our universities. Other times, the only people that can genuinely drive those plans for growth on infrastructure are the municipalities, in my case, the city council. In other occasions, those plans can only be resourced and understood by the commercial sector. And in certain circumstances, those plans can only be delivered really on the ground by our communities and from social enterprises. And then finally, the bit the university is always at their best at is an evaluation of are the outputs, the outcomes being met by those interventions, yes or no? And how do we loop back round to ensure that we know what works and what doesn't? And that is where universities should be at their best around understanding what works and understand that at pace and recalibrating what is required. Which then leads me to my fourth point, which is genuinely... Um, where universities need to be at. And, and here I'll be uh, challenging, but also supportive in my comments. Universities at their core with an amazing student base from undergraduates, access courses, foundation courses, through to amazing postgraduate um, research students, postdocs, the staff base, the research base is a phenomenal asset for understanding research internationally, understanding uh, in terms of empirical evidence what works and what doesn't, but also through the various research exercises, certainly in the UK setting and across Europe, understanding what impact 
the work will really have with industry, with communities to make sure that learning, that innovation, that ingenuity is being put into test on what really matters on the ground. Coming back to my point about local commitment as well as global aspirations. And universities need to think harder and harder about how they're able to translate, in my view, that amazing body and breadth of knowledge and translate it into policy making and the interpretation of what is happening now, as I said in the opening ceremony, one of the most febrile, one of the most fractured and one of the most challenging global and local contexts we've ever faced. But it's all to play for. And that is an amazing asset that places like Coventry need to continue to tap into, but equally universities need to freely offer it. And not just because it is the bottom line of a research exercise or could be lucrative in terms of future funding, or it could be interesting for a research area or some new PhD studentships. Now, this is about being core to the value that universities can play in reimagining economically our places, which then brings me to the, the final point, and then I'll, I'll be quiet. You'll be relieved to know, Nigel and colleagues. The fifth point is around where I started at the opening ceremony and my concerns, but also my incredible um, optimism about these challenges that we face. Surely the role of universities with all of our stakeholders in the ability to drive our realistic but ambitious growth for all of our places, wherever we are across Europe and connect them to other opportunities and to work with us to be able to deepen and widen that financial economic growth potential, but to make it so much more accessible and beneficial to so many more of our residents and our communities that quite frankly have missed out on previous economic outturns, surely must be now rather than ever at the core of what our universities can do. To not ignore those major global challenges and the grand challenges of our time, but to say well, here we are with our partners to be able to not solve them overnight, but to shine a light on them realistically, to go at the heart of what our structural inequalities and social policy damage, which is absolutely creating major fractures for all of our cities across Europe and the world. And doing that in a way which grabs the opportunities that are in front of us for our economic futures, which are about sustainability, green technologies, digital futures, but above all, the power of individuals to make change happen on the ground. And universities have always been and will always be the best conduit for that, but only if they continue to be realistic about how that change happens on their own patch. Hope that helps, Nigel, to stimulate some discussions. Thank you very much. As it's as it's my session, I'm just going to offer a, a couple of thoughts. I think before we before we move on, that um, one of the things that 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 I find challenging, perhaps in this space, and this might be something that that we can all reflect on towards the end, is, and and this actually came up a lot. And Ace will remember, and Arno probably as well, when we were when we were conceiving this utopia idea of of what actually we mean by place, that that one of the things that became apparent was place then means different things to different people. We at, we at Warwick, we probably think most commonly of our place as being the region that, we're, that we kind of label as Coventry and Warwickshire because we're in Coventry, but quite a lot of our students and staff live in, live in Warwickshire. Um, our colleagues at Ljubljana think of their place as being a much wider spectrum of, of, of locations that that they see themselves perhaps as representing a, a wider economic geography. Um, now, that, that in itself then I think often presents a, a challenge for universities, which is, you know, do you, do you go deep or do you go wide? And often, you know, there's a trade-off between those two things. That's why I kind of like the, the layer idea. Um, I think particularly that's why the, the concept of of universities as anchor institutions becomes important because then then you can kind of say okay what are we trying to achieve here now I, I interpret some of some of what you've said as being okay there are certain resources that universities can draw on in terms of not just placemaking but in terms of shaping agendas that ought to then translate into better outcomes you know whether that's on I don't know understanding how small firms get access to finance or how people access better mental health or how we help 
social enterprise, whatever it is. As you say, you know, our engines of research that are doing that, and that research in its, in its initial stages can be place agnostic, but then the challenge is, okay, so how do we then translate that into a better set of economic and social inclusion for our region? So unless Martin wants to come back on any of that, I'll hand on to I'll hand on to Arno, who will probably help us understand some of that. Maybe I hope to. Uh, well, thank you, Nigel. Thank you for bringing me in this uh, this discussion, and and thank you to Martin for uh, uh, laying out the uh, the key challenges that universities have have to uh, to meet to um, uh, contribute to uh, economic development. Uh, I guess my my intervention will uh, will be on how universities in practice can um, um, can help to um, uh, to meet these challenges and contribute to economic development. Uh, and and before getting into um, specific aspects of the question, uh, I would like to share some general comments on the notion of placemaking, which is uh, uh, clearly the uh, the central topic behind this this idea of contributing to economic development and and, and a core notion at the heart of the um, uh, e Utopia project. Um, when uh, Nigel Driffield asked me to, to comment on the contribution of universities to economic development, my first reaction was, was the somewhat natural reaction of a trained economist, which is what I am, and as everyone else on the panel actually is uh, today. Um, apologies for that. Um, and th this immediate reaction was, well, the connection between what universities do and, and the contribution to economic development is obvious, straightforward, uh, intrinsically and almost mechanically embedded um, in the missions of the universities. What, what universities do is first the transmission of knowledge, which, which involves both the education of citizens, but also the training of, uh, of younger cohorts uh, or uh, primate adults through continuing education in order to equip them uh, with the relevant skills for their labor careers. Uh, and these skills are what raises individual productivity and ability to meet social, uh, social and economic demand. And, and this is intrinsically highly conducive to growth and prosperity. And the second mission is uh, of universities is the production uh, and the advancement of new knowledge, which is uh, um, an important source of innovation, uh, leading to new ideas, new products, new processes, um, therefore, again, enhancing um, economic and social potential of our societies. Um, so the connection is a priori, a priori obvious. Uh, now, if you look into the numbers, um, the way economists typically do it, uh, uh, well, there there's, seems to be a, a strong empirical relationship. I, I bumped into a study uh, by preparing this uh, for this session, showing that uh, a 10% increase in, in university density, let's put it this way, um, leads to um, a 0.4% um, increase in, in, in future GDP per capita in a particular region. That's, that's true at the regional level. Um, of course, you might ask, well, what is the cost of Rising, raising by 10% uh, the uh, university density, but compared to the to the payoff in terms of GDP increase, uh, the um, uh, the return is uh, is is, is uh, unbeatable somewhat. Um, now, of course, practically, if we want to go beyond the numbers and and statistics, um, I think the essential question is. How do universities secure that their education and research activities um, uh, translate into something that is socially and economically relevant. Uh, how is it and how can we make sure that the training that universities provide, the skills they equip their students with, uh, the new knowledge, knowledge that they produce uh, are adequate to the present, but also to the future societal needs and challenges. And, and I think this, this relevant aspect is, um, uh, is, is the key challenge practically, and, and it's, uh, uh, it's the key issue at the, at the heart of the notion of, uh, of placemaking. Uh, placemaking is about linking universities with their local and regional environment. Um, and, um, and, and in order to, uh, to make sure that relevance uh, is there uh, through that connection between the universities and their environment. So in a way, that's, that's already a, a first answer to, uh, to Nigel's question about the fact that different universities define uh, place in a different way. Uh, this sort of endogenous definition of place is places where it's relevant for university to link their activities uh, on research and, and, and on education. Um, so with, with this issue in mind about, about relevance, uh, I, I would like to, to briefly need, uh, discuss the need to um, 
implement some specific schemes to secure the relevance of, um, of the university's missions in both research and education and training uh, in connection to their, uh, to their environment. And here I would like to, to draw for a few minutes on the experience developed at CY Sergi Paris Université to connect our research and training to uh, the local and regional ecosystem. Um, Ever since its creation about 30 years ago, uh, CY Sergi Paris Université has developed a policy aimed at promoting uh, collaboration with non-academic partners uh, in specific key areas of expertise. And for this, we rely on, uh, on a broad range of, uh, of tools to engage SMEs and, and leading in industrial partners, technology platforms, industrial cha chairs, common laboratories, cooperated with, um, uh, with external stakeholders, student entrepreneurship, uh, schemes, incubators. Um, um, it's, it's a long and, and, and pretty standard list um, that we are in the process of mainstreaming uh, to move from ad hoc collaborations to systemic engagement of external stakeholders. Um, now, um, and this has led to, uh, to various initiatives um, uh, in, through the taking the form of um, uh, the development of um, hubs of knowledge and innovation and technology transfer in various areas, such as educational technology, security, health innovation, et cetera, et cetera. Now, beyond these schemes, which are probably nowadays fairly standard tools uh, of university, that universities can use in their transfer and innovation toolbox, I would like to stress a specific scheme um, that we are currently implementing, which is probably more original to um, uh, our local context in Sergi and, and our national context more broadly. Um, this, um, this new initiative is what, what is called um, skill campuses. Uh, and it's uh, in French, it's called um, Campus des, des Métiers et des Qualifications. What these skill campuses are about is essentially some and enhanced versions of competitive clusters, uh, gathering key stakeholders of a specific economic sector. Now they depart from the uh, usual innovation clusters in two different ways. Um, the first way is the depth of integration of the relevant stakeholders. Um, it realizes somewhat the quadruple helix engagement of uh, universities, firm, government, but also social stakeholder. And if we want to get a little bit deeper uh, in, in, in this direction, uh, it's important to stress that um, the degree of uh, involvement of external uh, stake of stakeholders in the realm of education goes beyond higher education and research, and it also includes um, secondary schools and, and vocational schools in the loop uh, to, to cover the full spectrum of, of the training uh, uh, options and training needs. The second distinctive features of these uh, campuses of skills is the scope of activities that they conduct. What they do, as, as in, in, in any competitive cluster, um, they perform uh, cooperation in research and technology transfer between the firms and the university, but there is also a genuine um, ambition uh, towards the co-development of relevant training tracks uh, for, for our students, um, the students of the university, and even before that, the students uh, in, um, um, in, in secondary vocational schools. Uh, and the last um, diversification of the scope of activities is the openness to the general public and the civil society. So um, a good example of the implementation of th that scheme is uh, uh, the Campus des Métiers de Qualification de Versailles um, in, the, in the greater Paris area next to, uh, next to Sergi, which specializes in the area of art, culture, and heritage. Um, through various domains of excellence and expertise, ranging from the restoration and the conservation of built material heritage to French gastronomy. Um, the starting point of this uh, campus uh, was the historical accidents um, um, of the devastating fire uh, of the uh, Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris. Uh, this event highlighted the need for restoration skills that are, were specific to um, uh, historical buildings. Uh, also the need for understanding the specificities of the historical building process, uh, the need to develop new innovative process to secure better resistance, et cetera, et cetera. Um, which led to identify the need for this co-creation of new training and new technologies implemented by the campus through the, um, integration of uh, key players uh, in this economic domain uh, that the campus operates. Uh, the lead operator is, is uh, CY Sergi Paris University, but it in also involves the Chateau de Versailles, which is a, a famous, uh, uh, world famous institution, um, the local educational board, uh, the regional authority, um, 
a bunch of uh, important museums um, in Paris, but also in France more generally, uh, as well as a broad range of private companies and SMEs that are key actors in, in this particular area um, of art, uh, culture, and, and heritage. And, and to me, this stands out as, as, um, as a next step beyond the typical innovation culture and as a deeper way of, of integrating our university's activities uh, in its local environment, uh, which is both um, promising and ambitious uh, as a way to connect universities' missions in education and research to their environment. So my last reflection will be on the opportunities offered by Utopia to foster placemaking. Um, and I think those opportunities are, are tremendous uh, because it, Utopia would allow us to bridge uh, the local ecosystems of each of the members of the uh, Utopia Alliance. And I, I have two examples in mind that I will finish with. Uh, the first one is um, uh, the uh, Utopia Science and Innovation Fellowship Program, which is a postdoc program that, uh, that we have launched recently. Um, through this program, we want to connect postdoctoral fellows to non-academic partners in, with which their, uh, the postdocs uh, research can have an impact. And, and the idea of that program is to pool the partners of the six universities of Utopia uh, to broaden the scope of possible interaction for these fellows uh, that will be hired on the program. Uh, the second example I have in mind of a way in which Utopia could, uh, could enhance very strongly uh, the placemaking role of our universities and their contribution to economic development is to take the example of the skill campuses that, uh, that I've just uh, um, uh, discussed uh, and to, um, to suggest that basically such uh, structures, such um, um, platforms or if infrastructure for pooling resources and, and make, making different stakeholders meet uh, could be enlarged from the level of a particular university, such as CY, Sergi Par Université, to uh, a broader involvement of, of different university partners across the Utopia. So um, I'll stop here. Thank you. Um, again, just I'm just going to offer a, a couple of there was just a couple of thoughts that that were kind of running through my head as 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 Arno was speaking. Um, one of the things that that I think has come through both with with Arno and Martins is that that implicitly, as we have this idea of endogenous place that that Arno mentioned. Um, or the, the idea of sort of anchor institutions that, that Martin talked about is, is universities implicitly engage with almost, there are, if you can think of almost two sets of economic agents, there are, there's a set of economic agents that for, for, for either reasons of history or reasons of geography or reasons of opportunity, uh, there's one set that's relatively bounded in terms of space. So, Small firms, for example, are not typically internationally mobile. You know, if you're running a painting business in Paris, you can't necessarily think, oh, well, I'm going to go and expand into New York or whatever. Uh, and, th and the same sometimes with people, you know, that people who, who are doing certain types of activities, they are kind of constrained spatially. And then there's a whole other set of people. Um, and, and a lot of university staff perhaps come into to this category and certainly university research does, which see themselves as mobile. They see themselves as, as being able to go anywhere. And, and it seems to me that another way perhaps of, of putting this is, is we ought to be the conduits between those two things. The conduits between firms who are mobile, you know, large inward investors who might seek to locate in a particular place and also then local labor that is looking for jobs or local firms that are looking for places in supply chains or whatever it is and it it, it it struck me that linking to what martin said on the one hand we are we as a university we are located here you know and universities can choose to have campuses in dubai or australia or wherever it is but basically we are kind of rooted here and some universities are perhaps more rooted than others so but we can necessarily, we can, by definition, we can be a conduit between that which is mobile and that which is fixed. After all, you know, we all, all universities have students who come from the immediate area, but also students who come from anywhere. And then one of the, the jobs, perhaps, of someone like Martin is to convince those students to build a, build a life and build a career in the place where they've come to, because they either start their own businesses or they, they add to the stock of human capital. 
So it, it kind of struck me that perhaps that was another way of thinking about this link. Um, the one thing I am conscious that, that we have not said very much on so far is we are after all universities and we, I, and we haven't said very much about students. So at that point, I'm going to hand over to Anais because she's going to offer some thoughts on how the student learning experience and opportunities for students to get involved in this sort of process. Thank you, Nigel. Uh, I'm going to share you a presentation because, um, well, my English is not as good as Martin's and uh, are not, so it makes me it, it makes it easier for me to go on the storytelling that I want to explain. Okay, so let me share the screen. Uh, 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 do you see it? Yeah, okay. Oh, wait. Okay. So, um, I'm probably going to go over some things that or, uh, Martin and Arnaud and Nigel have already said. Uh, so, forgive me for being repetitive, but I think it's something that, well, what it, um, uh, it turns out is that we all think that we are like crucial agents in either um, whatever we consider the play. Okay, so the first thing I was going to uh, talk about is who we are and what we do. Um, so we are the uh, university and we are we have a bunch of faculty and researchers and then we have staff and who do we usually relate to we relate to students. We relate to prospect students, and this is something about uh, what it's been told about inclusivity. And we're, I think, we're trying more and more about this um, widening participation. So that's one of the of our missions that I think are not uh, already talked about it. And then we also, uh, hopefully, we are engaged with our alumni once they leave us. But then at the same time, we we'll talk. Sorry, let me let me make it smaller because I can't see the screen. Okay, so we talk. We usually talk to our cities. We are all at least the universities that are in the Utopia um, uh, Alliance. We all talk to our cities, so we we don't live behind the city. We talk to businesses, firms, uh, the uh, economic fabric, and then we also talk to society. So. Uh, this, what I've uh, underlined here in yellow, is what we would be talking about placemaking. So we are already making this placemaking, okay? So, uh, but what is the new thing that, that we are uh, doing on this Utopia uh, project and especially with this placemaking um, working package? And I, as Nigel was saying, well, something that we brought in a new in uh, this point was that we have a new actor in, which are students. So what we've done, because sometimes all the difficulties that, and challenges that we are facing um, the universities and the rest of the, uh, of the society and the, and the businesses and firms is that we do all this research and research it's not only like scientific uh, research, but we sometimes we can like give some advice on policy making or whatever and then we uh, and we have these connections with businesses but sometimes at least at, at the smaller universities or sometimes we we don't have those those uh, connections well done and those connections are broken and it turns out that everything that we do at the university mm, it not always arrives correctly to the society okay so that's the third. The first thing that we would ask is, well, is that really prosperity for all? So if we don't make these connections right uh, and in the right moment, then maybe we might be losing something in the in on the way. Okay. So as I was saying, what's new and what we've done on this uh, from the Utopia Alliance? Well, we've changed the approach, and as uh, as Martin was saying, we've we've gone from local to global and then of course we have local challenges but we have to have like this uh, global view and then we've got new stakeholders in so we have students we usually as we say as I said before we talk to firms we talk to society but um, 
even of course students are part of society but we've never um we've done it a, a long um, um, we've done it often without taking students into account and and forgetting that they are the future of our societies but as martin said also we the universities are the key actors and as uh, nigel was saying maybe is there's this uh, a double uh, role that we have that locally or, the, or with the fixed uh, um, actors that we have and then with um, global actors or with this mobile uh, actors that Nigel was mentioning before. So what we've done is we've, we've put all these actors in the middle. So we had businesses, we've, we've have the city, we have the society and we have students and we the university are like, like the boundaries of this uh, new set of um, playing rules. And we ask them, so we the university, we ask you, what do you think we should be doing? And how, what can we do it? And as um, Martin said also, it's not that we're gonna solve all grand challenges of the world, but it's a way to begin. So what have we done? Of course, we have pool of partners in the business and the city and pool of partners in the city and the IS society. So this pool of partners, it's of, of course, they are also key actors in this uh, development. So what we've done or what at the beginning, uh, as Nigel was uh, uh, remembering, um, we had this discussion about what was the first thing we thought is like, well, what do you consider place? And I was like, well, maybe place it's a little bit bigger than the city of Barcelona. And then he was thinking about uh, Coventry and the area. And so as Nigel was saying, all of us, we had like a different um, idea of what place was. But what we, we, had, um, uh, we had very clear from the beginning is that we had like this storytelling about what we were going to do. And it has like these five items, which was to engage, to observe, to ask, to create, and to give. So engage, we need to engage students, but also we need to engage the pool of partners, which are businesses, the city, the society. Then we have to observe. We need to observe what's going on in the world, what's going on in our house, so in our city, in our region, and we, we need to observe whether those observations, they are also uh, valid for the rest of the world. And then we need to ask questions. We need to ask, what do we need to solve? What are the main challenges right now that we have on the table locally and globally? And then let's solve them. So that's the creative uh, part. Okay, let's try to solve, taking into account, account what we've observed, what we've asked, and who are we engaging with? And then what the university can do, it's to give, as, an, as Arnaud was saying, that's our mission, okay? So we came up what we call with this local and open innovation process, and we are uh, engaging with the pool of partners, with students, and with, of course, with uh, all the faculty researchers, uh, in our universities. What can we expect? Well, what we expect is to go from productivity, which like the classical uh, uh, sense of productivity. So we do some research and then together with businesses, we uh, come out with some economic growth and when we turn it out into a new technology or a new vaccine or whatever, so let's go from productivity to prosperity for all. And that's when we need to count with the city and towards the society. So, I mean, it's very short what I had to say, but it's, I think it's more or less explains what we're trying to do with this uh, placemaking uh, package in the Utopia Alliance. Thank you. Thank you, Anais. Um, there are there is a couple of questions coming in, which I'll I'll get to in a second. Um, but I think to to kind of, I'll try and sort of pull together just a couple of of themes as that have, that I think run through all three speakers. Um, the first is you know we've identified we've identified perhaps 
the process or we've identified the relationships between universities and um, let's call it sort of prosperity for all. Um, but what we're also saying is that we also need to understand better perhaps the mechanisms and also the blockages in this um, to pick up to pick up what Martin was saying, you know, that that and it, it's in, in some ways that that's a bit like moving from the sort of theoretical to the practical. You know, we're all, as we've said before, you know, we're we're all economists on this. So when presented with this problem, you know, first thing we do perhaps is write down a model and see if it works. But the the important thing about doing that is not is not to demonstrate that, OK, so the effect is two and a half percent or two point four percent. But sometimes it's about understanding the mechanisms and the, the blockages in those mechanisms. Um, in terms, for example, of, of one of the things that occurred to me in terms of when Arno was talking and I'm I'm not going to try and remember it in French. I'm still learning French, um, but the, the, the clusters, the, the clusters idea. Uh, is whether whether we think whether we have a prior for example that universities should be at the center of that you know if you have a cluster you can either think of okay so is there a focal unit here and is that is that a firm is that the university is the university pulling in other things or is the university one of the one of the agents and that probably is the answer to that is probably determined by the nature of the place um, everywhere has universities in rich places and universities in less prosperous regions. And you could perhaps argue that the onus is where, where you have universities in less prosperous regions. Um, the onus is on that university to say, right, no, we are the we are the agent here. We are going to drive this. Whereas if you're a university in in richer regions, maybe you're one of the maybe you're one of the the conduits. Um, I, th I thought also what what one of the things that perhaps an ace were linking to what an ace said is if we, if we're going to identify the sort of the the journey from productivity to prosperity, clearly one of the things that we're saying here is that there are, if you like, there are private benefits and there are social benefits, and I don't think we should shy away from recognizing the private benefits to this. You know, um, universities, after all, what we are about, if we're about anything, we're about developing human capital. And we know that, and, and I'll come to this in, there's a question about COVID, um, just to warn everybody else on the panel. Um, but, you know, we know, one of the things that we know, and Arno studies inequality as well, is when there's a shock, the least advantaged do worse. And so one of the things that we do on a private level is we encourage students to generate further human capital for themselves so that they have better opportunities. What we are then trying to do at a social level is to replicate that for, as Martin said, maybe a street, maybe a region of a city, maybe a region of a country and, and give, give opportunity for everybody. Now, one of the things that, that I think universities, and I, I speak now only about the UK, is one of the things that, that universities have perhaps not been as good at over the, the last, say, 20 years or since I became an adult, 30 years, is we think of universities as mechanisms for social mobility, being giving an opportunity for one person to go to Oxford. You know, and we say, oh, well, wasn't that great? You know, we engaged with that school and one kid, you know, went through some program that we ran and that 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 person went to Oxford. And isn't that great? There's evidence of social mobility. Actually, what we ought to be saying is I'd rather. A hundred people go to universities that are that aren't mine as a result of my my intervention, then me have one person come to Warwick and get a degree. And that, that one person coming to Warwick and getting a degree is great, but actually I'd rather a hundred people went to different universities. You know, now if we can find a way of bringing those two things together, so much the better. Um, but to, to move on to the, the question then, so the obvious question has been posed, unfortunately, I. I can't name the person, it's been posed by U1770753. Um, so I can't name check you, but how That's do- Probably how do we... someone from UPF because it's how we are named. 
<laughs> ours it could be Warwick as well. We have we ah, have okay, Warwick. okay. It could be either. Um, how do you think that COVID will change universities' roles and relationships with their cities and regions? Um, as I'm the chair, Martin, you can go first. I think the points I was trying to make that have been picked up by colleagues answer that question. I think universities now have got an even bigger responsibility in light of the pandemic on the way in which data, empirical evidence, epidemiology is being used and abused actually to make sense of that, number one, more so than ever, but number two, the massive widening social inequalities that we're seeing through the unfortunate torchlight of COVID-19 means that universities must work even harder at doing what they do best, which is ripening the problem, understanding the problem, uh, framing the problem, and then understanding what is possible in order for us not just to respond and to recover in our cities and our regions and our countries from the pandemic, but to do something which is absolutely difficult and challenging but necessary in my view which is to leapfrog the advancement for example on what we really mean by productivity now in terms of the power of what we're doing on this call and what that means your point about human capital Nigel we are going to have to rethink productivity the units of not just human capital but social capital the value that we ascribe to infrastructure to um, monetizing data all those things for me we got great opportunities that have been brought into sharp relief as well from the from the virus so the universities are best placed in in our places to be able to make sense of the problems to frame them diligently carefully and reflectively but also to start producing some of those amazing innovative solutions at scale as we move forward. So not a big ask everybody, get yourself sorted because you've got a bigger role to play. I'm reliably informed that the person who asked the question is Richard Hutchins, the Director of Strategy for Warwick University. So we could actually put it back and ask, ask him to answer his own question, but- Yeah, what see. are you gonna do Dr. <laughs> Hutchins? What are you gonna do? Any observations from, from an ace or Arno on that? Um. Go Arno, I'll, I'll speak later. Arno, I think you're muted. Oh, sorry. Okay. Uh, is that better now? Um, yeah. Again, and apologies for that. It's, it's going to be another prototypical economist answer, but there's going to be sort of short run and long run effect. Um, but definitely in the short run, if uh, in the short run, there's 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 a, a huge emergency, I think, um, that that relates to the role uh, of universities at, at creating, if not necessarily prosperity for all, but at least opportunities for all. Uh, and I think there's a, there's a huge concern for the young generation of uh, university um, uh, first year students who are the, the courts entering um, higher education uh, in this very complicated time where their uh, their integration into the university system is making uh, is made much more difficult by um, by the pandemic, uh, which is, I believe, uh, for the weakest part of these um, uh, sort of upwardly mobile students that Nigel was talking about, um, there's a there's a critical threat for them that they might nevertheless drop out uh, with um, uh, dramatic potential effects further down the road. And, and I think um, there's, uh, this is one of, the, one of the game changers in the very short run in terms of, uh, of uh, university's responsibility um, towards their catchment areas, whatever they are, but definitely their, their cities and, and their regions. Um, for the longer run, uh, clearly the, uh, the situation is somewhat loosening um, any type of links uh, any entities might have uh, between, between humans, between institutions through these sort of video links or these Zooms that we have uh, now. And, and it's probably going to modify in, in a less predict predictable way um, uh, the engagement, the local engagement of our universities. So, uh, uh, but definitely the, the short-run emergency is, is very important to keep in mind. Okay. I'll, I'll be very short. Um, of, of course, there's like this um, very obviously uh, obvious uh, link, which is 
on the scientific and finding the vaccine or finding uh, all this uh, like uh, deep science that of course it's done at the university. So that's something that it's very uh, straightforward. But as they, as my colleagues were saying, of course, there's our responsibility on the social and economic effects of this pandemic. Um, I can talk about uh, what is going on in Barcelona, that Barcelona is a very, as you know, touristic area and the effects of the pandemic has have been very, very, very uh, um, harsh. And now our partners are coming to us and say, please, we need to, to at least change a little bit our model because we cannot rely only on tourism and we have to rely on other things. And one of the things that we have to rely on is in innovation on science and um, creating new talent that would at the end create a more added value. So, I mean, we, as Martin was saying at the beginning, uh, we are crucial and we cannot, uh, we cannot look uh, I don't know how you say it in English, to uh, turn around and um, turn back to uh, our cities and our regions, because I think uh, we need them and they need us. Thank you. Um, I, I personally, I think there are probably three areas that at a local level, universities are going to get, have to get more involved in than they have previously. The first, the first one, bringing, back, bringing us all the way back to the sort of the research process is, is things like crises like COVID. And it's actually here I, I could almost reflect on the sort of the financial crisis of kind of 12, 11 or 12 years ago as well, is, is certain things move much faster than national policy is used to. So if you normally you think about a response to a crisis, a government would do an evaluation, there'd be then some sort of evidence, then there'd be a review and then they might spend some money. And one of the things that, that we're seeing this time is, is that is way too long. And so universities can almost be honest brokers in that process, you know, that we have a large, as we've talked about already, we have a large research, research capacity and we could say, OK, for example, where are the gaps going to be in crucial supply chains? You know, and, and, and we have people who work in business schools, in engineering departments, in, in economics departments who answer questions like that all the time and can move much quicker than the national policy, for example, would want to in terms of how we respond. And we could quickly say, OK, there's going to be a yes, whenever we start, we can start building back or we can still come in back. But there are going to be a set of firms who are so challenged in terms of their um, their cash flow that they are going to need help to come back. And if they don't come back, then longer supply chains are going to be in trouble. The other one, and I think this is probably the, the biggest almost untalked about in this space, is mental health. You know, we have no idea. I, I can remember, I mean, three weeks ago, we we booked a, an, out, an outing to... Harry Potter world in, in Watford. And I, I remember being stood on Coventry station waiting for the train at something very early, like seven o'clock on a Friday, on a Saturday morning, knowing the train was going to be empty, but still feeling really apprehensive about getting on a train, having basically sat in my, what is my spare room at home for the last nine months. And there must be loads of people who are, who are, we're going to have all sorts of mental health issues. And using the word productivity, we know that the worse your mental health is, the lower your productivity you have. And equally, the lower productivity you have, the more likely you are to experience mental health issues. And it, it strikes me that, again, you think of all the behavioral science, all the behavioral economics, all of the psychology that departments that go on in all the good universities, they're going to have to play a role, I think, in understanding the nature of, of the country's mental health. And then the third one is just innovation, I think, more generally, you know, that we know when firms are hit with cash flow problems, the first thing that stops is innovation. And, and universities have a, a key role at Warwick, organized groups like Warwick Manufacturing Group, but Arno talked about the, 
the cluster du métier, I think you said. I might, have, I might have missed out a couple of words, but, um, you know, but universities have a key role, I think, to make sure that innovation doesn't get forgotten as businesses just kind of scramble for, for cash flow and to stay afloat. So they're what I think are my answer to Dr. Hutchins, who probably knows the answer better than me anyway. Martin, it's flashed upon my screen. Martin would like to answer this question live. So no, I, I, I was going to send something um, suitably rude back to Richard, but um, he wouldn't allow me. So um, what, what, could I just make one comment, which is quite challenging of, of universities in light of our conversation over the last uh, uh, 55 minutes and what you've just said, Nigel, about isolation, uh, about lack of connection, as a result of the pandemic. And it's something that's always worried me. So I want to share it with trusted colleagues. The challenge with universities is unintentionally, but sometimes intentionally, they create and you create campuses and physical worlds, which are very impenetrable to people that aren't of that world. And what you have done and continue to do and I think it is mainly unintentional, is create almost a biosphere, a, a kind of hermetically sealed world. So therefore, what is required, in my view, is a sense a humility about what that does to people that feel excluded from that world, but also gives you an opportunity to think about your students, our students, your workforce, your skills, your knowledge that can transcend that physical, practical world and reach out to connect to people next door to you, half a mile away or 10,000 miles away. And I think unless you're honest as academics, as vice chancellors, as students to say that this is not for everybody, but the power of what you can bring can be inclusive can be sustainable and can be reaching out with solutions to people that don't want to cross over into your physical world, I think is a really heady responsibility and one that some universities are stronger at understanding and leading on for growth and for humility in their places than others. And I, I just want to challenge you to think about it is more than physical design. It is a state of mind that if you talk of, as an aided really powerfully about the, the, the widening of participation. It's real, I know it's real, but it doesn't feel real to many of our communities who would never imagine what it could be like to go to a university and enter a campus. I think that's, I think that's, a, really, I think that's a really valid point. And I mean, it's, it's something that, that I've kind of personally, I personally found interesting for a long time, you know, just going back to when I went to, when I went for university interviews, being, as a lot of people of my age are, the first person of my family to go to university. And I was kind of walking around whichever campus, I think the first one I went to was the University of Nottingham. And I kind of went round in awe of the place and then noticed how many people were just so much more comfortable, you know, and I was kind of hoping to get in and they were, being, they were seeing as they were just going to choose where they were going to go. And I think the, the understanding, just, just trivial things like that can make such a difference, which is why I'm not going to, to sort of bang Warwick's drum too much, but why our engagement with schools and with getting in, get, you know, giving opportunities to people who've kind of not had a great school opportunity. You know, I really love the fact, just one last point on that, I really love the fact that I work at one of the world's top business schools, but we still have places for people who've, perhaps been let down or not taken advantage of, of the schooling opportunities. I think that can be that can be so powerful. Um, I'm aware we've got one minute left, so I'm going to let anybody offer any last um, contributions that they want to. If not, that's the time ticked over. So I shall rescind that offer and just say thank you very much to everybody, because I know that most people want to move over to the closing ceremony. So. Thank you very much. And I hope the audience found that as interesting as I did. Thank you all and see you at the closing ceremony. Thank you, Nigel. Thank you all. Bye. Okay.